Hey there, welcome to the Seth Joyner Show presented by Bet Parks. Man, it is a talk to him Tuesday because I has had the feeling that, you know, you guys just wanted to talk about it. You know, um, I could have had a guest to come on and eat up 30 minutes of the show. But, you know, you can tell how I'm feeling, how I'm dressed. I still got the hoodie on. I feel like I played on Sunday and lost that game the way that that game went down. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. You know, you got to move on, do what you got to do. Um, there's some things about this football team, ladies and gents, that just straight up bother me in a, in a, in a huge way. Um, I would hope that at some point in time that Nick Sirianni would come out and say, you know, um, something other than what he's been saying all season long. And that is, you know, we got to get better. We got to fix this. We got to do that. Listen, we're you're going into the last week of the season, last week of the regular season. Um, you've given up a, what was it, 21 to 6 lead against the Giants. <clears throat> you come back. Um, I don't know that that number is actually precise, but it's in that range. Then you turn around, you give up a 21 to 6 lead against the Arizona Cardinals. And, you know, you're just in one of these situations where they've been searching all season long. They haven't been right all year. And um, for some reason or another, they're still searching. To me, a lot of that boils down to, you know, how you run as a team. That boils down to coaching. Now, don't get me wrong. There's not a single coach that goes out there that throws a pass or catches a pass or blocks or makes a tackle or covers anybody. <clears throat> That's not the coach's job. The coach's job is to prepare the football team from a strategic standpoint and figure out what your team's buttons are week in and week out and how do you get those players ready to play. Um, what is it that motivates um, your leaders that in turn get your leaders to lead the young guys who doesn't who don't understand the urgency of the moment and i guess that's the thing that bothers me the most is that there's no urgency on this football team now you guys always hear me talk about accountability and you know people always like to bring up the bring up the topic of, oh, you know, throwing the players under the bus. I'm, I'm, I need you guys to help me out because when has discipline, accountability, um, owning what you do and what you don't do, um, you hear a rookie talk about the things that you do in practice basically manifest themselves in the game. If you don't practice physical and you don't practice fast, then in the game you won't practice physical or fast. Now, y'all tell me, how the hell does a rookie understand that? But you got veterans on this football team that don't understand that. I, I Help me with that. How is it that the coach can hear the rookie say that, but you haven't heard him come up and say anything to that level? Now, granted, you don't have to take a player and point him out and say he played bad or he played bad. You can best damn believe that I'm going to do it, but, but I'm not the coach. If I was in the coach's shoes, then I would handle it differently. You know, yeah, I can have those conversations behind closed doors, but there's not a thing wrong with me saying as a coach, as a head coach or a position coach or a DC, there's nothing wrong with me speaking to my team 
through the outlet of the media and saying, you know, we need to practice better. We need to be more physical. We need to do all of these different things. There's nothing wrong with you as a coach doing that. But these coaches continue to step to the mic post game after post game, midweek after midweek presser, and sell us a bunch of baloney because they're afraid to overstep the bounds of holding their players accountable. Okay. When you got injuries that are stopping drives, not injuries, excuse me. When you got penalties that are stopping drives, missed tackles that are prolonging drives, you can't get off the field. The, 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 the Eagles defense gave up 28 first downs to the Arizona Cardinals. Let that sink in. 28 first downs. Just for a moment. Think about that. 28 first downs. That's unconscionable as a defense. Unconscionable. That cannot happen. Where is your sense of pride as a football player personally and as a unit to allow that team, a 4-10 and 10 team, to come into your backyard and do what they did to the Eagles? And then Nick Sirianni wants to give us the same token phraseology, if you will, that, you know, we got some things we got to fix. And you've been saying that since week one. You haven't fixed it. You know, you haven't fixed it. Your offense is fragmented. Your players are disinterested. You keep calling the same silly ass plays week after week. There's no creativity to what you're doing. You got your number two wide receiver injured. Why? Because we talked about this last week right here on the show. Why in the hell, please tell me, why in the hell are you throwing screenplays and asking your 150-pound wide receiver to go block guys? I don't understand that. You got A.J. Brown. You got Julio Jones. You got Alameda Zacchaeus, who loves to block. You got Dallas Goddard, who loves to block. What you're going to ask your 150-pound wide receiver to go and block in a situation for a bubble screen. You should be throwing him the bubble screens and letting the other guys block or put him over on the other side and put AJ's ass over there and have AJ block at 6'2", 220 pounds. Just think about the, this, th these things that these coaches do that makes you just lose your mind. It's no different than his... No different than his his explanation. I mean, he actually said, for all intents and purposes, you know, the reason why we didn't throw the ball, you know, in that first and 20 scenario, the second to last um, series, is because there was too much wind going in that direction. Really? I, if my memory serves me correct, you played two games in howling wind and rain. And you threw the ball almost 40 times in both of those damn games. But last week, you couldn't run it. Then I see Brian Johnson say, well, you know, we call a quarterback draw in that situation, a quarterback sweep. We are trying to, you know, get a few yards, you know, maybe pop one. You're so predictable. They knew exactly what the hell you were going to run, and they were sitting right there waiting on it. They do things backwards. That's the situation where you should be passing. It's first and 20. You need a touchdown to win this game. Your defense hasn't stopped this team all day long. What in the hell gave you any kind of confidence after Jonathan Gannon tried to onside kick, whatever hocus pocus reason he gave, yeah, it worked out that way, that, yeah, you didn't want to allow them an 80-yard drive to burn up the clock. Whatever. It's, you know, you want to talk about hindsight. There you go. Okay. But you allowed, after they gave you the ball on the plus side of the field, you got in a situation where you didn't even try to score a touchdown. All you did was became you settled after it got to after the mile out of hold. Then all of a sudden you made the decision that we're we're just gonna play for the three points.
I think I was listening to Jordan Malata actually, you know, on WIP on my way over here to the studio today, this evening. And he said, you know, what plays do you have in the playbook for first and 20? No, you don't have any that can that can net you a first down on first and 20, but you certainly got one that can give you seven yards on first down and seven yards on second down and seven yards on third down, and you got a first down. But when you run two quarterback draws on first and 20, second and 20, what the hell you think you're going to get out of that? Zero, nothing. That's what you're going to call? Why you keep putting all the emphasis on Jalen Hurts to carry this football team when you when how we went out and got all of these weapons? Okay, you draft Devontae Smith, you got Dallas Goddard, you trade for AJ Brown, and you give him a King's ransom. And in the most critical times of the game, instead of you utilizing these players, these options, these great weapons, you ask your quarterback to play running back. How much sense does this make? And then y'all want to know why A.J. Brown is pissed off and don't want to talk to the media. I give him a lot of credit for keeping his mouth shut because y'all, y'all, you guys out there that are 40 years and older, you guys remember me back in the day. I couldn't keep my damn mouth shut. I just let it fly. Now, I'm not saying that that's what he should do, but I give him a lot of credit for being able to hold his tongue. Because I understand how he feels. There's not a team out there that can stop A.J. Brown on a slant route. When you need to get a play, you can give it to him. Someone please tell me, how are you second down and seven in the red zone? And instead of and, and and your quarterback looks up, and you got a loaded box. Now, I'm not 100% sure if Jalen Hurts is making some of these checks or whether these are situations where these are called plays. I kind of get the sense that that's not the case, just based upon how Brian Robinson, Brian Johnson, rather, um, addressed why he called the plays that he called in that first and 20 situation, okay? That might not be Jalen Hurts checking at the line of scrimmage. What that is, is that they're making these calls, these safe calls, because they didn't want to get pushed out of field goal position. So now you got second and seven in the red zone, okay? The Arizona Cardinals have loaded the box, and you got A.J. Brown split right all by himself. And before the ball snap, I'm like, oh, they got A.J. on the slant. This is a for sure first down, a touchdown. They run a quarterback draw. They ran a quarterback draw for, for and lost yards and wound up having to kick a field goal. And you guys want to know why A.J. Brown is pissed off. I'd be pissed off, too. I just give him a lot more credit than I would give myself because in that situation, I would have been said something. Ben said something, you know, and and and, and it, it really makes no sense. And, I, and I'm pretty sure these conversations are going on behind the scenes between AJ and and Nick Sirianni and Brian Johnson and all and the players, you know. But they're calling what they want to call. Sometimes, you know, listen. I grew up in an era where I could come off the field and have a conversation with the coach because no matter what those guys were seeing up in the press box and no matter what the coach was looking at from the sideline, he wasn't in the battle. He wasn't in the moment. Now, you got to get to a point in your career where the coach understands that you're 100 percent committed, that you're doing the work necessary to be able to have these open conversations and dialogues with them in game about what's working and what's not working, okay? Anytime that you get a coach that gets to a place where he doesn't hear his players anymore, that coach is going to have a problem because I'm the one that's in between the lines. I'm the one that's in the fire. I'm seeing the blocking scheme. I'm seeing how they're trying to run the football at me. I'm seeing how they're trying to attack us. Not that the coaches up in the, in, in the box don't necessarily see that, 
because they see it too. But there's some intricate things that are going on in between the lines that sometimes coaches don't see that players see or a player feels like he can set a defender up a particular way or that he can take advantage of a matchup that a coach might not be able to see. So let's try this. And I think what's going on is that Brian Johnson and Nick Sirianni aren't hearing their players anymore. And in turn, their players don't look like they have confidence or believe how they're being coached and what they're being asked to do. Okay. Hey, listen, you guys are listening to the Seth Joyner show um, presented by Bet Parks. Um, please um, hit that like button. I appreciate you guys. Appreciate the support all season long. Um, please comment, share. Um, most importantly, go to um, Seth Joyner's show on YouTube and please subscribe. Um, I want to keep bringing you guys this content, you know, as long as I can. Um, but I'm just, I'm a little fired up today. Um, I wasn't earlier, but on the way over here, just driving and listening to, you know, WIP radio, hearing some of the commentary, um, it really, it, it fired me back up. You know, um, a player said, was asked, you know, what's the confidence level of the team? And he said, I think it's good. <laughs> I think. Confidence isn't one of those things that you can think about. You're either confident or you're not. And I would, I, I would ask either one of y'all, you know, to explain to me how it is that this football team can be confident the way that they played the last four or five weeks. You know, how can you be confident when you had the Seattle game one and you let Drew Locke beat you? How confident can you be when you have the Giants, you know, at halftime, on the ropes, just they, they were waiting, waiting to quit. And you did everything you could to help them hang around. And they made it a game all the way down to the last play of the game. How confident can you be when a 4-10 and 10 team rolls into your house And you got a 21 to 6 halftime lead. And you come out after halftime and pretty much piss down your leg and give the game away. How confident can you be? You want to know who's really confident right now? The New York Giants. The New York Giants missed a field goal last week, or they would have beat the Los Angeles Rams. They lost by one point against the Rams. The Rams might be one of the hottest teams in the National Football League right now. Certainly, probably the hottest team in the NFC right now, okay? And the Giants took them all the way to the bitter end. Do you think that the New York Giants, even though they know that this is their last game of the season, do you think that they believe that they can't beat the Philadelphia Eagles? You damn right. They not only do they think that they can beat them after watching them lose to the Arizona Cardinals, they believe that they can probably mash their ass. So the Eagles going up the 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 turnpike, they got another dogfight on their hands because they didn't express to the New York Giants the last time that they played them that you don't belong on the field with us, and we're gonna prove that to you as we beat your ass down. No, you let them hang around. You gave them confidence. That's what you normally do. And then they hung around long enough to finally beat you, to, 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 to barely lose, I should say. Okay? So this time around, they're going to be hot, and they're going to be ready. And the Eagles better be ready to answer the call on um, in all phases, in all phases. All right. Once again, thank you guys for liking. Thanks for the comments. Thanks for the share. Um, please um, subscribe, continue to subscribe. And right about now, I'm gonna let you guys get some, um, get some things off your chest. 
um, as my producer fires some of your questions. Um, and from here forward, you know, we got one break, um, probably in about 10, 15 minutes, just you and me tonight, venting at each other. Uh, once we come back after, you know, the break, we just, the rest of the show, nothing but comments. All right. First question fired at me. Okay. King Meta wants to know, how do you have Rashawn Petty on the team and he never, ever sees a damn field? Listen, when we found out last week on Sunday, on Monday, whichever one it was, I can't remember. Hey, Happy New Year's, by the way. <laughs> See, my, I'm all screwed up over this darn Eagles loss. Anyhow, when we saw, saw that he was active, everybody was kind of excited that we might see him in action. Um, listen, I don't know what's going on with Rashad Penny. Does he not fit what they're looking for at running back? Then why do you sign him? Has he not picked up the offense in a way um, that gives them confidence that, that if they put him in there, he knows what he's doing? Um, if my memory serves me correct, when he was active early in the year, he was not a very good pass protector. Not like we have many, any of our wide, uh, running backs are very good at blocking. They all stink, you know, to be honest with you. But I don't remember him being very effective, you know, in passing situations when teams came after us. And teams are coming after Jalen a lot more because we don't have hot routes and we don't have sight adjustments um, for our wide receivers. Um, Jalen is tasked with, making the the one free run a miss and hitting a big explosive play down the field rather than them side adjusting cutting routes off and him being able to you know have blitz beaters so if that's the case and they get themselves in a situation where they become pass happy maybe they feel like they can't trust him um, to be out there on the field because he's not good at protections and not good at blocking blitzing linebackers and blitzing safeties. So I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I I, I wish somebody would have gifted me $1.3 to $1.5 million to sit on the sideline and do nothing. You know, just show up at practice every day and lift weights and sit in the meeting rooms. Um, Y'all know me. I wouldn't have been happy doing that shit either. But, you know, just, just, just throwing it out there. Next question. <laughs> Jill wants to know, do I think Slay and Bradbury can still play and just need better coaching? Listen, Darius Slay, his numbers aren't that bad. Um, I think that I think he's got stuff left in the tank. And I believe that, you know, his ineffectiveness and his lack of aggression in certain places is a combination of what was ever that was going on with his knee along with the defensive philosophy of how the Eagles asked him to play. James Bradbury on the other, on the other hand, um, it's more evident um, than ever that he is a zone cornerback and you sporadically put him in situations to play man because he doesn't have the foot feet, foot speed, his legs are too long. The whole start and stop thing is changing direction. His foot speed is like super slow. Um, he can't live in man coverage. That's just not who he is. That's not how he's built right now. Um, so as bad as, you know, sometimes the young guys look, and I'm not so sure that I understand why it is that Matt Patricia continues to um, rotate Eli Ricks and um gosh was 22 um somebody help me here um why i can't remember the kid's name um anyway it, one of you guys are one of you guys will give me his name in a second you know, I, I don't understand ringo keely ringo why is it that you know the game continues on and they keep rotating those guys in and out you know I would much rather see those two guys play on the outside and then and take James Bradbury, James Bradbury off the field because teams are targeting him. They're going to come continue to come after him, okay? So if you're going to leave him on the field in obvious passing situations, you better figure out how you can play a boxing one with this dude 
where you're doubling, giving him help because he is going to, he's, it, it's a problem. It's a problem when they need to go, man, they can't go man because they're going to target him. If the quarterback gets the pre-snap read in that direction. Okay. Um, but it's obvious to me that the Eagles really need to get younger at corner. And it, it, it might be, it might be one of those situations where, you know, you need to live with these young guys growing up a little bit. It may be one of those situations where, you know, you might need to make some trades in the off season and, you know, go get a guy that you can bring in here, um, you know, to, to give you help on the outside. This He's young enough and maybe has a year or two left on his rookie deal um, where you can bring him in and you got him for a year or two to kind of figure out, you know, whether you want to extend him beyond his rookie contract. So I don't know, man. I, I, I There's so much wrong with this football team. You know, you, 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 I, I, I value your question, the fact that you're concerned about the corners, but – the Eagles have got problems, you know, at every position, in my opinion, as you as you look at it. The defensive line, which was built to be the strength of the defensive side of the football team, they're just plain and simply not getting it done. Um, and I've got issue with the fact that you're going to ask Hassan Reddick, the guy that's leading your team in sacks, to drop seven times in coverage against the Arizona Cardinals. Made no sense to me. Um, and, and listen, you, you gotta, you gotta give Jonathan Gannon and his staff credit because they were able to put the Eagles defense in those situations, in those, in those predicaments where they forced, um, Hassan Reddick into coverage when maybe that was not the play. Um, anyhow, uh, that's my take on on where the cornerbacks are at this point in time. Next question. Um, all right. Basecoin reacts, wants to know, is it possible they are playing possum? No. To be ready for the playoffs? Listen, everybody wants to be peaking when you get to the playoffs. Ain't nobody playing possum. You ain't playing possum when you lose to the, to the Arizona Cardinals. You ain't playing possum, you know, when you let the Giants hang around or – you know, lose a game to Drew Locke and the Seattle Seahawks when you had it won. I'm not playing possum. You know, they're just in a bad way right now. I, I don't think that these players believe in what they're being coached to do. I don't believe the defensive players believe in, in, in the change that they made at defensive coordinator. I think that was a massive mistake because there's nothing that Matt Patricia was going to be able to do assuming – Sean decides defense. You couldn't change the defense. How are you going to change the defense? You can make some tweaks here and there. But even, you know, Matt Patricia hasn't been known as a defensive guru like that. He's still behind Bill Belichick, you know, and that's where he cut his teeth. But even Bill Belichick isn't a high-pressure, you know, type of defense coordinator. They rely on their defensive front, the New England Patriots. They very rarely, you know, in the last – 10 years have had a premier pass rusher. They got guys that play the run extremely well. And, you know, they play coverage behind it, cover two behind it. That's that's who and what they are, you know. So you go and you bring in a guy who cut his teeth under those auspices and you bring him in and you have him replace the defensive coordinator who put the system in place. And now you give him the keys to the kingdom and you think that he has any clue how to fix what's wrong with this team on the fly. He's experimenting with things and I'm watching it and I'm looking at it and I'm asking myself, what in the hell are they trying to do with these coverages and these looks, but they're experimentations. Why in the world do you go to a five man line and then take Nolan Smith and put him at middle linebacker? Nolan Smith is not a middle linebacker. You drafted him to be a edge rusher. Put him where he belongs and let him play. The guys that you decide to roll with at linebacker, those guys got to continue to play. They just got to play better. You got to coach them up. And if you can't coach them up and you ain't coaching them up, then maybe you just need to think about the coaches that you have on this staff. 
Are they equipped? Do they have the tools? Do they know how to coach a player beyond the X's and O's? You guys hear me say it all the time. It's one thing as a coach to understand X's and O's. But as a position coach, if I'm coaching linebackers, sometimes, you know, sometimes I'm a dad figure because some of these kids, like myself, come into the league and you grew up without a dad in the home. So guess what? You know, you need somebody who can be a dad figure in with certain situations because it ain't always all just about football, okay? As a coach, you have to get to know each and every one of your players. And if I got seven, eight linebackers in my room, guess what? I need to get to know each and every one of them. How far can I push him? Maybe I need to pat him on his back. Maybe I need to kick him in his ass, okay? Can I motivate the entire group through just that guy, okay? All of these things as a position coach, I need to know. And then... It's not enough for me to hand them a game plan every week, but I got to be able to have the wherewithal and the ability to look at my players playing and realize that they're not getting from point A to point B because of X and then have a remedy for them and then how to give them tools to put in their toolbox. So when they're out on the field playing live in a game, when everything is live, and those X's and O's aren't, aren't, aren't just stationary, but they're breathing and thinking and acting aggressively. How can I give them the tools that they need to be successful? That's what being a position coach is really all about. How do I teach my guys how to play man coverage? How do I teach my guys that when you're in a man, when you're in a one-on-one -on -one rush situation against a running back, you ought to win that battle 90% of the time. So how am I, can I get them for 15 minutes, 20 minutes every week and go over pass rush with them and pass rush technique and teach them how to be the block? Can I teach them, you know, how to be more aggressive in their pass, in, in, in their in their man-to-man -man situation? That we're not going to just sit back and let the, the, the tight end or the running back come to me I'm going to eat up the space and beat him up. I'm going to take my shot, and then I'm going to get on his hip, and I'm going to roll with him and run with him because I'm confident that I can cover him. Why? Because I've been coached how to do it. My position coach has given me the tools and given me everything that I need to be able to go out on the field and succeed at whatever it is that he asked me to do. That's what's being, that is what being a position coach is really all about. And if you're a position coach and you reach the level of the National Football League and you don't have anything to offer your players each week other than a game plan, you have no business holding that position. You have no business holding that job. That's just a fact. People can get mad at it all they want. I don't give a damn. That's the fact. And trust me, I've been in some situations in my career where all that my position coach could do every single week was guard, was, was grade the game film and hand me a game, a game plan on Wednesday morning and stay the hell out of my way the rest of the week because he couldn't, he had nothing else to offer. How is that even possible when you're talking about the elite of the elite, the best of the best, the creme de la creme? How do you get to that level when you've got coaches on your staff that can't help make your players better? How come our, how come our cornerbacks aren't backpedaling? and opening their hips. They stand straight up, and you want to wonder why it is that they can't cover a damn soul? Why is it that our safeties and our linebackers have to try to tackle everybody by the shoulder pad instead of tackling them down around their knees because they can't run without their knees and their feet? And I'm not talking about running and getting two yards away from them and diving. I'm talking about going body to body Put your body on their thighs and wrap them up and squeeze them like you're trying to squeeze some damn juice out of them. With all the missed tackles that you continue to see week after week after week after week, what is being talked about in these position meetings week after week? That you see these players making the same damn mistakes and you have no remedy for them. Let me get one more question before I go to break. Sarah Dunn wants to know, short of a Super Bowl win, should Sirianni lose his job or stay and replace the coordinators? Listen, I, I'm, I'm not one of those people 
that's in the camp of calling for someone's job. Jeffrey Lurie and Howie Roseman will assess that at the end of the year. This is the only thing that I'll say in regards to that. You, Nick Sirianni has a problem if those players, if 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 what he's saying is going in, is coming in one ear and going out the other, then he's got a problem, okay? Because as the head coach, if you can't get those players to buy what you're selling, okay, if they can't see the evidence of success based upon what you're doing offensively, what you're doing defensively, what you're doing special team-wise, if they can't see the evidence of success that they can get to the playoffs, get to the Super Bowl, make Pro Bowls, get their personal accolades after all the team stuff, if they can't see the evidence of that success, then guess what? Your voice becomes like the teacher in Peanuts. Womp, 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 womp. And you guess what the players do? They get amongst themselves and it's like, man, here he go with that BS again. Really? Now, if that's the case, then Jeffrey and Howie will figure that out. I don't know that we're at that place um, because I'm not close enough to it to really know. I'm, I'm just not. I'm not close enough to it to really know. But when I look at the faces of the players after a game like Sunday, when I see the body language of players walking off the field, when I see, you know, your all pro wide receiver not wanting to talk to the media, that says a lot. That says a lot to me, and I'll leave it right there. When I come back, I'll get into one quick um, one-on-one whiteboard breakdown. Just want to show you guys um, the craziness that's going on on the de defensive side of the ball and how Hassan Reddick got pulled out of a rush situation into a pass situation and how – the Cardinals set it up perfectly to, to, to make, you know, major yards running the football. They, they, they just manipulated the front, you know, and um, I want to share that with you after this break. I'll be back. When you open the Bet Parks app, you're in the zone. Winning is always a rush, but the money is in the moment. It's the confidence and underdogs covering the tension before a clutch turnover and the pride of a parlay paying off. It's another chance to win big with all-day action. Plus, win your first $10 bet and get $125 in sports bonus bets. You play for fun, you love to win. You bet. Bet Parks. If you understand that success is built on trusted relationships and dependable performance, MidPen Bank is the right bank for you. We're on a mission to prove that the right bankers can make a big difference. We work harder, we get things done, and we're in your corner. With financial centers strategically located throughout the greater Philadelphia region and new locations in central New Jersey, we're ready to bring you the best in commercial and personal banking. Call or visit us today to connect with a professional MidPen banker. Member FDIC. Go Eagles! Welcome to Bridgeview Partners, where IT and business innovation merge. We're not just another tech company. We're your strategic partner in navigating the ever-evolving digital landscape. Our team of experts tailors cutting-edge solutions to fit your unique needs, and ensuring your success is our top priority. Elevate your business with Bridgeview Partners. Discover the power of partnership and tech innovation today. Contact us now to experience the difference. Bridgeview Partners, where innovation meets excellence. Welcome back. You guys are viewing the Seth Joyner podcast presented to you by uh, Bet Parks um, as we get into a little whiteboard here. Um, I just want to show you guys, you know, this scenario that I witnessed um, the other night. Um, the um, let me do this right quick. Um, so. The Cardinals lined up in this formation here, and they you had Hassan Reddick lined up right here. Okay. So they brought this guy in motion 
and they sat him down outside here. Yeah, that's a big circle. Set him down here, which caused his son Reddick to move out here. And he, now he goes from a potential rush situation because the strength change, okay, to a drop situation. Now, there's nothing wrong with this in theory if he gets out here and he can react back inside. The problem is the lack of communication between him and this tackle is the problem because once he re once he's removed out here okay look at the space here and there's really no contain on the edge right here there's nothing no one man in the edge right so what winds up happening is the cardinals block back seal double work up work there block back well he didn't block back well he blocked there let me give you a, let me give you a cleaner look he blocked there he blocked there this guy pulled okay this guy pulled they hand the ball to james connor right here and he's off to the races okay now What's the problem here? The problem is that Hassan Reddick never really communicated with this guy here. Because if he communicates with this guy properly, you want this guy to move in this position here so at least he can hold the edge, okay? But the fact that he was able to block down now, you're probably going to get that linebacker blocked this way if that's the case. But the problem is, you know, they're outflanked. They're outflanked in every way as far as the defense is concerned. Now, Hassan's out here. He's looking inside. This guy comes and seals him off. Now, look at the alley. This guy comes and he seals here, and he's up for the next available. Look at this alley, this, this huge alley that James Conner has to run through. And, and these are the things that go on, and you guys are wondering why we can't stop the run. Now, what should it have, what, what should it have looked like? I know I got a lot going on, but I got a lot to show you. So, okay. I'm going to take it all the way back. So there's your center. Um, your tackle, 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 end, end. So when he comes in motion, okay, and he moves out, there should have been some communication here. And you want to get this guy to line up out here, okay? Now, so you got him blocking back, him blocking back, probably trying to get up and get the linebacker, and him blocking back, and you're still going to pull these two guys. So if the linebacker is reading properly, the minute that this guy pulls, he should be right here right now to take that block on, okay? This second blocker belongs to Hassan Reddick or the safety, whoever comes down, okay? But if you at least get this guy to move over, now you get stronger at the point here and there's nothing off the end for James Conner to actually have when he's got the ball right here, okay? Maybe he's got to run that ball up in here where even though this guy's getting blocked back, back upon, maybe he can fall in here and make a play or the linebacker reads it properly, gets over here, sees James and then falls back in, okay? But these are the issues that plague this team, and as long as they can't run the football, it's going to be hard for them to win, you know? It's going to be really, really difficult for them to win football games if they can't get this run under control, and they have no clue. You know, the defensive tackles aren't using their hands and getting off blocks um, because of all the crazy things that they're doing as far as coverage is concerned and the five-man, you know, listen, they, they need to, they have to pretty much be in a five-man in order for them to stop the run. But when they get into a five-man, it makes them weak on the back end. So now it's this chess match that's going back and forth, four or five, four or five, four or five. When they get in a four-man front and they play two high safeties, that's a six-man box. If you can't stop the run with a, with a six- or seven-man box, you certainly can't stop it with a six-man box. So what are the teams doing? They're making a commitment to run the football. They're double-teaming both tackles. 
the linebackers aren't seeing it fast enough and playing downhill and pulling those double teams off. We've been talking about this all season long. I've been talking about this ever since Nick Sirianni became the head coach here about how these linebackers play. Howie, please go get us some linebackers who know how to play football, who know how to actually read what's going on in front of them. Because put me up on a whiteboard one more time. Just one more time. When these linebackers line up here at this depth, okay, I'm not even going to put the lineman in there. Oh, let me put him in there. You got a double team here, okay? Nope. You got a double team here, and you got a double team here. Now they start pushing these guys, okay? Because the linebackers aren't seeing this, this is his gap, okay? And move him over a little bit. This is his gap. So if the ball comes this way, okay, he's got to get here. He's got to get in this gap, okay? That's going to force this guy to come off. So now he can play his gap, okay? He's going to be fine in his gap. And now you got the defensive end out here, the tight end here. He can fill this gap, okay? But when you're not stepping up, okay, and it's the same scenario if you go the other direction, okay? Ball comes here, double team, okay? This is the tackle's gap. So you got to come downhill right now and pull this guy off so he can play that gap and you can play that gap. This linebacker is going to check this A gap and then he's flow to the football. Okay. But what's happening with our linebackers is while all of this double team is going on up here and they're pushing these guys back off the ball, they are literally standing right here where they are. So by the time they react to the ball, because they're looking at the running back instead of reading the offensive line. And by the time they react, these guys are in their laps. Okay. And they've just eaten up four to five yards of space before our linebackers had even stepped up in the gap. How is that possible? Now, you can't tell me that this kinds of thing, okay, I'm good. You can't, you can't tell me that if I understand this, that these guys who are coaching at the highest level don't understand this. I don't get it. I don't understand it. You don't the, the, the linebackers don't have to be outstanding, but you don't give your defensive line the opportunity to be as great as they could be or to be as dominant as they can be when you got 600 pounds laying on them every single play because the linebackers don't know where the hell they fit. I don't understand it. I don't get it. It, it, it ain't rocket science. I'm telling you right now, it's not rocket science. Okay. And when you get in the five-man front, it's even easier to stop the run because that linebacker that's on the field, he's got a one-gap to flow read. And the safety, they're, they, they're going three safeties out of the five-man look, and then they're dropping the safety down in the box. So you have a, a seven-man front, seven-man front. And you're getting the ball ran down your throat like you're in a 3-3-5. Three, three, Next question, man. Let's get it. Bobby wants to know, um, how is it our vets are being outplayed, schemed on the defensive line? Um, I think I just showed you. Thank you. I wish I would have saw that before, but you just saw it. You know, our big guys are getting double teamed. Um, you know, even in our even in our five-man front, you know, throw me up on the whiteboard one more time, okay? Even in our five-man front, you know, we get a line pretty much like that if that's the center and there's your end. OK, I would much rather see. I'd much rather see our alignment look more like this for the defensive tackles. You got your nose tackle. OK, let's kick. Let's kick these these tackles out in a three. OK. And then put your ends here. Put your ends here. So now instead of them being able to block down, now you can hold the point. OK. 
Jordan Davis should be destroying this guy. I don't know what the heck's going on here. And he's got to hold the point here. Now, you got a linebacker here. Wherever the ball goes, okay, you're either you're going to slow play here for the A gap or you're going to scrape here. If it's in the other direction, if the flow is here, he's going to slow play or flow to that C gap. But what the Eagles are doing also is that, let me just scratch that out. They've got the linebacker playing here, and they start off in two high safeties, and they drop him down in the box. So you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven guys in the box. So if he just played his gap, and he destroyed that guy, and he destroyed that guy, and he contains, okay, and you got a tight end here, and he destroys that guy with outside contain, okay, you got one, two gaps. That's it. You can even blitz from this. Send a safety, send a backer. What are they going to do? That's a run blitz that would work all day long. Hold your blocks, hold the line, and wait for the running back to get the ball and commit. If this is your gap, play your gap. But I can tell you what happens with the defensive tackles. Because they're getting gashed so much, they're trying to hold a gap, and they see this guy do that, or they see him go here, they stick their head here, he bounces it out there. I can tell you exactly what they're doing and exactly what's going on, okay? It's, I'm telling you, it's not rocket science. For these linebackers not to know where they fit, and if you're going to drop a safety in the box for the run, for him not to know where he fits, after you've been getting gassed all, all season long, that tells me, it's like I used to tell my young kids when I coached them, okay? So I tell you once, I tell you twice, then I'm going to, I would put them on my shoes and walk them through what I wanted them to do. And I would tell them a third time, okay? And then I would look at them and say, after the third time, we have a problem, okay? Either I'm not communicating in a way that helps you understand what it is that I need you to do, or you're hearing me. Now, there's a big difference between hearing and listening. You're hearing me and not able to execute what it is that I'm asking you to do. This is not possible, in my opinion, at the pro level when you're holding your players accountable. If you're showing me on film and you're showing me in game plans and you're showing me in the cutups every week that this is how teams are attacking us and this is what, what we have to do to fix it, and here we are in weeks 18 and we still don't have it fixed, we have a problem. We either have a communication problem that the coaches are telling them to do something and they don't comprehend it, or they comprehend it and get in the game and decide to do it a different way. And if that's the case, they got a major, major problem. Next question. Lloyd wants to know any free agent linebackers you have in mind for next year. Draft them. Go get you a good linebacker coach somewhere who knows how to develop talent, okay? And I would say get you a linebacker coach who's an ex and no guru, and then go get you a linebacker coach as an assistant linebacker coach who really understands how to coach the position. And let the X's and O guys teach them the, the schematics of the game and let the assistant who knows how to develop talent develop the talent and show them how to play the game. The Eagles need to stop this nonsense of believing that you can just go and take special teams player, perennial special teams players that wasn't that good at the college level and bring them in and be starters in the National Football League. Go and draft some damn linebackers. Howie? Spend a third rounder on a guy that's proven. If you got a mortgage two threes to get another two, go get that guy. And I see Jeremiah Triad Jr.'s name just popping up all over the board. But he ain't going to do it because he might have to use a first rounder to go get him. He ain't going to do it. 
We'll be sitting right here next year having the same conversation all over again. And the defense will be getting their asses handed to them all over again because they are so stubborn. Next question. Pete wants to know, is it just possible um, that the sports books have too much influence on our sports today? Pete, I don't know, man. I, listen, I, I'm, I'm hearing all the rhetoric. You know, the NFL is fixed. The game is fixed. You know, sports betting, you know, has its its hooks in the National Football League and how the NFL is sharing in the profitability, you know, of, of the gambling scene. But the NFL will turn around and suspend a player for a whole year for placing a bet on a team. Now, if a player is betting on his team, I got a problem with that. Or against his team, I got a problem with that. But if a player is just betting on, on football and, and the National Football League has made it okay for gambling. It's okay for you and me to gamble, but a player can't just gamble on how 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 two faced it is that. How two faced it is, and and I don't know to be honest with you. I don't know, you know, if that's the case. I hear the rumblings. I see the stuff on social media, you know. But at the end of the day, nobody knows. Nobody knows. Well, the thing I do know is the Eagles care more about, I mean, not the Eagles, the NFL cares about their money and they're going to make their money because back in my day, you guys remember not too long, too long ago, it was a cardinal sin to be associated in gambling in any way. Even on the fantasy side, the NFL made certain players dissolve their partnerships with casinos in, in Las Vegas for just fantasy football. Because it was gambling. And then once the NFL figured out a way how they could monetize the gambling aspects of things, oh, it's okay. And then you got Kurt Warner doing, you know, um, gambling problem called wait at 1-800-GAMBLING. And now the NFL is concerned about whether you have a gambling problem or not? Next question, please. Chris wants to know why are we so inefficient last why why were we so inefficient efficient last season not so much this season I, it, Chris I apologize man I'm just all fired up today why were we so efficient last season not so much hey listen it's a new year you know teams have spent the entire offseason trying to figure out how to defeat this team and I think from a philosophical standpoint you know Everybody knows what the Eagles want to be. They know that at the end of the day, they want to limit explosive plays on the defensive side of the ball, so they play passively. And they're okay with just taking what the defense gives until, you know, you get into a position where, you know, you have to do something like play man-to-man -man coverage, you know, and then they attack the weak spots of the defense. On the offensive side of the ball, it's the same exact thing. You know, if the Eagles would just drop Jalen Hurts back and take the five, four or five yard passes, commit to running the football in a balanced way, and sight adjust in blitz situations, this offense would work as efficiently as it did before. And to boot, they put bubble wrap around Jalen. Now to the point where they're so protective of him. What he provided in the run game last year, it's not present in the run game this year because now that they paid him $255 million, they're trying to figure out how they can keep him healthy. And if anybody knows anything about the National Football League, or if anybody's ever played football before, you can't protect a player. You can't protect him. What made this offense so great last year is Jalen Hurts rushed for over 700 yards last year. I would be shocked if he's got over 400 this year. I really would. I really would. A couple more questions before we get on out of here. Mark wants to know, would I be comfortable with Dean and Cunningham starting next year? No, we need more. Listen, you can't, you can't rely on the Kobe Dean, you know. I mean, two injuries in one season that has caused him to miss the majority of the season. How many games did he play? Two, three games? 
you know, so you can't put your eggs in that basket believing that, you know, he's going to evade the the injury bug. When I look at him, he's he's small. He's really small, you know, and I know he gained some weight from last year to this year, knowing that he was going to be the guy. But when I look at him, he looks like one of those linebackers that you have to, you have to eat up both guards and both tackles and just let him flow to the ball. Because if he has to take on any offensive line and his blockers, he's going to get swallowed up and lost. Now, yeah, he makes a lot of plays because he's an effort and a hustle player. But he makes a lot of tackles five, six, seven yards down the field. I don't need that kind of linebacker. I need a linebacker who's going to step up and check an offensive lineman's chin, get off the block, and make a tackle. You know what the Eagles need? The Eagles need a playmaker. They need a playmaker at safety. They need a playmaker at linebacker. The problem with them right now is they have no playmakers. You know, they, they have a bunch of guys that's content to do their job. And the cornerbacks are so afraid of getting beat deep that they won't break on a ball unless you call a roll coverage like um, a roll coverage like they did with James Bradbury, Bradbury when he had his one and only interception against Josh Allen. They called that play because they knew they had an idea that that's what Josh was going to do. So they call that, you know, jam the guy and roll back into it, okay? But if they're just playing man coverage and they're in phase with the wide receiver, they're not undercutting any routes. The reason why the Dallas cornerback, Bland, and all those guys down there have so many interceptions because guess what? They know that even if I get beat, I'm going to use my speed to get back in phase. Not panic, but get back in phase. And once I'm in phase, okay, I'm not going to just – try to make the tackle after the guy catches the ball, I'm going to undercut the route. I'm going to close the passing window and make a play on the football. We don't make plays on the football. Okay. Sidney Brown will come up and put his helmet on the ball. Reed Blankenship will come up and lay the wood. Who else they got that will play that way? What corner do you see that will come up with some urgency and say, you know what? I'm going to make this guy pay for running the ball my way. Our guys are like, hey, I get paid to cover the, you know, cover wide receivers. I don't get paid to make tackles. That's exactly how they play. So when you need them to make a play, they don't make the play because I'm not going to, I'm not even going to say it. I almost said it. You know, I, I was on WIP on Monday, man, and thank goodness for the um, time delay because I cussed live on air and the time delay caught it. They had me so worked up. Last question before we get out of here. Hello World wants to know, what do I think of the Michigan defense? Man, come on. Um, give me a give me an eagle question. We ain't talking about no Michigan. They about to get their doors blown off them next week anyway. How about that for an answer? <laughs> Chandler Sampson wants to know, we have played at high levels at points in this season. How would he, how do we get consistency is it only coaching i think it's a combination of things i think players play at a high level when they have confidence in what you're asking them to do um i believe that the players don't have the utmost confidence in what's being what's they're being asked to do so they're not playing at the most efficient level that they can you know i like to see them play with a lot more intensity a lot more fervor you know, I don't see guys flying to the football. When you watch the Ravens defense or the 49ers defense or the or the Cleveland Brown defense, those guys just be flying. You know, I talked about a couple of weeks ago. Every single time that an offensive player has the ball in his hands, be it a quarterback, a receiver, a running back, or a tight end, the mindset has to be from every player, oh, my God, that guy's got the ball. I got to make that tackle. Not – Somebody got to make the tackle. No, I got to make the tackle. The mindset has to be, it's incumbent upon me to make this play because if I don't make the tackle, he's going to score a touchdown. Now, when you get everybody to start, their mindset is like that. 
and everybody's running to the football. And again, I give you Sidney Brown. The way that you practice is what manifests itself in the game. That tells me that they ain't running to the football in practice. They're not playing. They're not practicing with intensity. See, if I'm coaching that defense, that doesn't fly with me. You're only on the field an hour anyway. You mean to tell me that you can't go all out for a freaking hour? For an hour. Because certainly the way that you practice is the way that you're going to play. Certainly if you're not preparing yourself and you're not studying film, and you're not studying your game plan, it's going to be reflected in the game. And it is so obvious to me, so obvious, that not only do these players not believe in what they're being asked to do, but they ain't got a snowball's clue. They ain't got a clue how the opposing team is trying to attack them. Because one of the tenets of making plays is playing the game from an anticipatory position where you see a formation, you understand the down and distance, you understand where you are on the field, and you remember what a team's tendencies are and what they like to do. So if I drop to a zone and I know how what routes they like to run, I'm anticipating. Now I'm watching the quarterback and I'm not guessing, but I'm anticipating that he's going to throw this dig. So if I'm anticipating, I'm a step ahead of his arm. When he raises his arm, I'm already on my way to the interception. These guys don't move until the ball's already in the air. And they wonder, we wonder why they're always a step behind. Not only in making the play on the ball, but making the tackle. Or breaking on the football. You make plays by way of being prepared. The offense knows the down, the distance, and where what they're trying to achieve. If you don't put enough time in studying your opponent, there's no way in the world that you can play football defensively from an anticipatory position, okay? And offensively, it's just execution. They got to stop shooting themselves in the foot with untimely penalties. They got to stop making mistakes one guy at a time. Jalen's got to stand in the pocket, okay, and play quarterback and realize that, yeah, you might get hit. But there ain't no need to me running out of the pocket and throwing an incomplete pass. If I'm going to get hit, then I might as well complete standing there and complete the pass. That's what great quarterbacks do. Linemen got to stay on their blocks. Receivers have to catch the football. And running backs got to hit the hole. If it ain't nothing but two yards and a cloud of dust, put your damn head down and get two yards and go back to the hole. But I, I don't see, I just, I just don't see how it is that, you know, you don't play like it means everything to you. See, I love football so much. It's like, I don't, I got 17, I got 16 games. If we're fortunate enough to get into the playoffs, we get some more. 52 weeks. Out of 52 weeks, you only get to do what you love. The 16 to 17 weeks. And you're going to tell me that you can't give everything that you got? Somebody might be bigger, stronger, faster than you are, but you know what each and every player has to give? They got they got effort to give. And if I'm coaching a team, that effort is non-negotiable. You don't want to give me everything you got, then you sit your ass over here next to me, and I'll find somebody who will. That's what the game of football is all about. And, and you can't tell me these players don't know it because you don't get to this level and not know it. There's something wrong. There's something amiss. There's something that these players don't believe in or something that they ain't buying into that won't allow them to do that. Now, I'm not saying everybody. I'm not pointing the finger at everybody. I'm not pointing the finger at every coach. But it's up to the guy with the HC by his name to get everybody on board because he said that it's his name that's on everything that you see. His name is on the play calling and the offense. His name is on the defense and his name is on the performance that you see out on the field. Figure it out, Nick. Shouldn't take 18 weeks to figure it out. 
figure out how to motivate your players and get under their skin and get them to do what's necessary. I'm done. I need a bourbon right now after all of that. Y'all got me fired up today. Listen, thank you all for tuning in today. I went about 10 minutes over, couldn't help myself. Again, um, thank you for tuning in. Thanks for the likes. Um, thanks for the follows, um, for the comments. Um, and please continue to subscribe uh, to the Seth Jordan Show. As always, be good to each other. Take care of each other. Most importantly, make sure you love each other. A happy, healthy, and a prosperous 2024 head to you and your loved ones. Peace. Are you selling your investment real estate? Are you interested in deferring your tax with the 1031 exchange? At RevX, we're experts in 1031 exchange planning and the use of passive real estate options using DSTs. Not in the midst of an exchange and want to invest in real estate, but don't know where to start? Revolution X has institutional grade real estate options for any size investor right now. Set up a consultation at RevXWealth.com. RevX, defer the tax, maximize the gain. At Mandrakia Law, we win big personal injury cases, but we always tell our clients up front that those cases almost always hinge on how much insurance coverage people or companies have. At Mandrakia Law, we don't sell insurance, but we're experts at helping our clients make sure they have the right insurance to protect their businesses and families. Do you have the right insurance? Most people don't. For a consultation, visit mmattorneys.com or call 610-584-0700. Mandrakia Law, aggressive attorneys who get the job done. This is Seth Joyner, top analyst for the birds. I've also analyzed the best auto dealerships, and I drive a Davis Honda. Fall into savings at Davis Honda. Over 300 cars available. And right now, get rates as low as 0.9% at Davis Honda in Burlington. Plus, you'll get two years of free oil changes on every new and used Davis Honda vehicle. See why Davis Honda continues to win outstanding awards for sales and service, including the highest award from Honda, the President's Award. Get to Davis Honda in Burlington. Fall into savings at Davis Honda. J.P. Mascaro & Sons is a family-owned, locally operated, Operated solid waste service company in business for over 60 years. You've seen the red trucks with the blue elephant that symbolizes strength and reliability. Mascaro is different than other national brands. Like the birds, Philadelphia is home. They'll take care of all your waste removal needs. They have it all. An experienced workforce, state-of-the-art equipment, a cutting-edge recycling center, and their own disposal facilities. Call 888-MASCARO or visit jpmascaro.com.